This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Macro Voices, episode 242, was recorded on October 22nd, 2020. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode of Macro Voices is brought to you by TopTradersUnplugged.com, a podcast dedicated to quant and rules-based investing, helping investors overcome behavioral biases, and by FarmTogether.com, bringing farmland a new trillion-dollar investment opportunity within reach of all accredited investors. Professor Stephanie Kelton has been making waves in political circles with her book, The Deficit Myth, which advocates for public policy adoption of the principles of modern monetary theory to enable more, not less, government spending, using the power of central banks to conjure new money supply out of thin air to finance government spending without necessarily raising taxes or borrowing from foreigners. Professor Kelton joins me as this week's feature interview guest. Due to Professor Kelton's very busy schedule, we were only able to get a 30-minute interview with her. So we'll be supplementing that with an extended post-game segment this week in which Patrick and I will discuss the feature interview in more depth than usual. And then, with Patrick back from his break, we'll have another of his signature chart decks to top it all off. And I'm Patrick Ceresno. Now, Eric, let's jump to that S&P 500. For all of the hype going into the elections, the market volatility is uh, rather narrow. What's your take on what's going on? Patrick, I think we've reached an equilibrium point where the market has priced in that there is a fair amount of certainty in uncertainty, but that uncertainty is already priced in. So I think that a clean sweep where it's very clear who has won and nobody's really contesting the outcome of the election is going to be a big up for the stock market. As far as whether or not there's a big down for the stock market, certainly if you had civil war war breakout. I think that's a down. But what if it's just a modest uprising of civil unrest? I think a certain amount of that is already priced in too. How much is priced in and how big of a deal does the contested election have to be before you reach the point where the increase in civil unrest boils over and really causes markets to melt down? I'm not sure. I think one thing that we are seeing, though, is the certainty that some people had, the narrative if you will, that, well, it's a shoe in The polls say Biden is certain to win. That's breaking down. It's looking like there are echoes of 2016 when uh, Hillary Clinton was up by, uh, you know, everybody thought it was just a done deal. Hillary's got this thing just totally wrapped up. And then in the end, there was a surprise. So I think that it is still a close race. It's not at all certain what the outcome is going to be. Although I will say, at least in my mind, there's some degree of certainty that not everybody's going to agree on who won by the time it's over. All right. Well, let's move on to the U.S. dollar index because back in September, it really looked like uh, there was some sort of a U.S. dollar breakout underway. And really, the dollars just uh, came right back into the pocket here. It's consolidating back down to those August, uh, September lows. What do you think is going on in the dollar here? Well, Goldman Sachs comments on Wednesday that a stimulus deal was looking less likely than previously thought sure didn't help. We still need a daily close below 92 to really deliver a technical signal that would cement the message that, hey, the, the dollar's really in trouble here. Uh, we haven't seen that yet. And I think it was the Goldman comments on Wednesday that caused that big drop below 93. We're at 92 spot 88 on the December contract as we're speaking on Thursday afternoon. Uh, still below 93, but you know, we're not below 92 yet. So uh, I don't think that uh, it's time to declare the, the dollar is completely dead. I think what we're seeing, though, is a wait again for the election. I think all markets are basically in a consolidation waiting for the election. If we have nobody knows who the president of the United States 
States is major, major unrest cropping up all over the country, and the Supreme Court has to decide the election outcome, uh, I think the dollar could really take a nosedive. Frankly, if we get a clean sweep or anything approximating one, I think it potentially sets the stage for a dollar recovery, because I think a lot of the weakness that we've seen so far was based on that uncertainty. So does uncertainty go up or down after the election? I think that that's going to answer which way the dollar moves next. All right, well, let's move on to crude oil, which continues to stay confined in this narrow trading band. Any hope for some action in the energy markets anytime soon? Well, Patrick, crude oil inventories came in drawing down a million barrels this week, Cushing, Oklahoma, building 975,000 barrels, gasoline building 1.9 million barrels, distillates, though, drawing down 3.8 million barrels. That's a pretty big drawdown for distillates, and it comes on the back of the biggest drawdown in more than a decade that we saw just last week. Now, most interestingly to me, U.S. production is still down. We did have that tropical storm go through the Gulf of Mexico, which is obviously obviously going to take things down. That was a couple weeks ago. So is that the reason that we saw another half million barrel drawdown to 9.9 million barrels of U.S. production this week? Is it still storm related or are we seeing the beginning of what Art Berman predicted, which would be a steep decline in U.S. production that Art thought would start sometime in Q4, although he was leaning toward the end of Q4. Uh, I'm not sure which it is yet. We'll have to wait and see if that recovers next week. Now, the tape action was down fairly dramatically after inventory came out, but it's likely that the comments from Goldman Sachs about a less likely stimulus deal, which came out about the same time, just a few minutes after inventory data came out, probably had more to do with influencing that sell-off than the inventory numbers themselves. As far as the time spreads at the back of the curve, which I mentioned in the last couple of weeks, they're still performing better than the front month is, but the pattern that we were seeing where they were consistent consistently closing well above their short-term moving averages has changed. We, we've seen a sell-off in those time spreads. So that early indicator that I thought might be telling us about an upside breakout coming in crude oil, so far that's uh, not really holding up. We'll have to see what next week brings. All right, well, let's move on to gold because uh, the last uh, few weeks, it kept looking like gold was going to start to turn up and potentially break out, but it, it just continues to also be range bound in that same pattern. What's the next move for gold in your mind? Well, you could certainly make an argument that Wednesday was maybe an interesting technical signal in gold because we had the first daily close above the descending triangle resistance line. The thing is, it didn't stay there. You know, it was uh, a daily close above it yesterday. We're right back down below that line now. And we almost tested the bottom end of that wedge, which is the 100-day moving average support at 1892. So we're still consolidating, even though there was technically a breakout above the line. Frankly, I think that was based on the narrative about Biden having a shoe in for the election, breaking down a little bit in the news flow yesterday. I don't think it's really meaningful yet. I think what we're waiting for is to find out not so much who wins the election, but how much uncertainty there is or, or how contested the outcome of the election is, and particularly how much of an increase in civil unrest occurs. There's police departments around the United States bracing for they're not sure what might be coming next. Is it all a big false alarm or is it the beginning of something really big? I think if it's a clean sweep and nobody is really uh, uncertain as to who the president of the United States is, I think gold continues a correction to the downside. On the other hand, if you had a major escalation of civil unrest, that could be the setup for a big move to the upside. So I don't think we find out until the election results become clear or perhaps I should say become unclear. All right. Finally, let's touch on those 10-year treasury yields because while the dollar, oil, and gold seem to be in these range-bound pockets, the uh, 10-year treasury yield has really started to uh, break out on the upside out of that uh, range it's been in for the last six, seven months. We're at spot 8.4 on the yield. Do you think this is a legitimate breakout here on the 10-year yield? Well, I don't think that we've seen a big enough move yet, but the move is in the direction that I would expect it to be in. You know, as I've been saying for several weeks now, 
Uh, I'm really unsure as to what the timing is, but at some point, I think that we we have a shift to secular inflation, and certainly modern monetary theory and the changes that we're seeing in public policy could bring about more inflation. Is the bond market already signaling that with higher yields, that inflation is coming, or is this just a blip? I don't think it's big enough yet to really confirm that macro outlook, but I'm leaning more and more toward the the general opinion that probably the bond bull market finally after 38 years or whatever it's been probably is coming to an end has has reached its top and that we're headed toward higher yields but you know it's a very complex macro picture and there still are a lot of open question marks we definitely need to get into today's feature interview with professor stephanie kelton and talk about mmt and what it's going to mean in terms of public policy because that's a big part of the equation well, this week's feature interview guest is best-selling author, Dr. Stephanie Kelton. So, Eric, why Professor Kelton? Well, as our regular listeners know, we've wanted to get her on the program for months and months. We finally were able to get her to agree. Unfortunately, we could only get a half-hour interview. We really do appreciate that. She has a very busy schedule. She normally doesn't do podcast interviews at all. She made an exception for us, which we very much appreciate. And uh, unfortunately, the downside of that was we could only get a half an hour. And Patrick, in anticipation of what I'm sure we'll get is feedback from our listeners who are going to say, hey, why didn't you get... Warren Mosler to come on the show because he's really the father of MMT. Uh, Warren Mosler has been a perfect gentleman. I really appreciate his style. He was very polite, very cordial, but also very firm in saying no. He just feels like he's done enough media. He said, look, all of my work on MMT has been written down. Go read it. Please leave me alone. So uh, it seems like a super guy. I appreciate him being so cordial, but he was just not interested in an interview, although I would love to interview him as well. So we're going to just take the half hour that we could get, and then we'll do an extended post game and have some of the discussion just between us as to what I wish I had had, had the opportunity to ask Professor Kelton. Listeners, we know many of you agree with us that we're the best financial podcast on the internet because that's what iTunes and Apple Podcasts used to say about us. Unfortunately, we haven't been reminding you to do those ratings and reviews, which keep us in our number one slot, which we really feel like we deserve. And by the way, that's what helps us get the very best feature guests to come on the program. So your ratings and reviews really do help us to get better feature interviews for your future listening pleasure. Writing a five-star review for Macro Voices is simple. The instructions step-by-step are in your research roundup email. This episode was made possible by TopTradersUnplugged.com. In recent weeks, we've been reminded of the fragility of world financial markets and how quickly sentiment can shift from risk on to risk off. Once again, the mantra of buy the dip and the determination of central banks will be put to the test. But as Chris Cole recently told us, The best approach to investing in the long run is very different from what's worked best in recent decades. To help Macro Voices listeners navigate an uncertain future, Niels Kastrup Larson, host of the Top Traders Unplugged podcast, has created a guide to the best investment books of all time. You can get a free copy at toptradersunplugged.com forward slash macro guide. And be sure to listen to my full-length interview with Niels Kastrup Larson on trend following. The download link is in your research roundup email. Check out toptradersunplugged.com today. You'll be glad you did. Eric's interview with Professor Kelton is coming up as Macro Voices continues right here at macrovoices.com. And now with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is best-selling author, Professor Stephanie Kelton, widely known both as an expert on modern monetary theory, and I would say even more so as one of the most active promoters of modern monetary theory in the public policy arena. Dr. Kelton, thank you so much for joining us. The book, of course, is called The Deficit Myth. So I want to dive right in to the six myths that you bust in the book and talk about the first one, which is, you know, the, for years and years, we've had this debate in, in public policy where everybody says, OK, we, we've got too much debt. The political left says that's because we're not taxing 
the rich enough and the political right says it's because we're spending too much. But both sides historically have generally been willing to agree that expanding the national debt is a big problem. You've got to balance the budget. You say that's not really true, particularly for monetary sovereigns like the United States that control their own currency. So why that distinction and why is it a myth that it's important to pay for what we spend or what the government spends through taxes? First, thanks for having me on. And and so let's just jump right into the very last question that you asked, you know, this idea that governments have to pay for things. And the way that, you know, I was taught when I was a graduate student studying economics and the way that the vast majority of students today are taught that the government faces a budget constraint, right? And that governments have choices when it comes to how to pay for their spending, that a government can pay for its spending with revenue. That is, you know, they use tax revenue. And if they need to spend more or wish to spend more, then one option is to raise taxes, to come up with the money in order to pay for that additional spending. The other option is that governments can borrow. And so they can go to savers and they can borrow to finance the spending that way. And then the third option, which is the one that quickly gets buried under the rug, is, you know, the recognition, well, of course, you know, a sovereign government, and if it has its own currency, it can always print money and pay the bills that way. And, and so there are these, this menu of options, right? Three choices, which one will the government choose to pay its bills? And MMT comes along and says, wait a minute, if we look operationally at how government finance actually works, we learn, we discover that there's really only one way to pay that all government spending, I'm talking federal government spending, so for a government like the US or the UK or Australia or Japan, that there is only one way to pay, that all government spending is indeed already and only ever paid for, financed with new money creation. There's no other way for it to work. And so, you know, once you get that recognition, once you kind of arrive at that point, then you sort of scratch your head and say, well, then what what are the taxes and bond part? What's that about? You know, and it took me, I will admit, it took me a while to get to that point. I think the first or second peer reviewed article that I ever published was titled Do Taxes and Bonds Finance Government Spending? Because, again, as a graduate student, I was taught that's exactly what they do. And it was only later when I encountered the work of Warren Mosler that I began to question my own understanding of how government finance works. And then after a period of months really working my way through this stuff and the mechanics of government finance, I was able to persuade myself that I had the ordering, the sequencing wrong, and that the government spends new money into existence and only after it has spent those dollars into existence are they then available to either pay taxes or buy government bonds. Now, let's go a little bit deeper on those taxes and bonds, because what a lot of people would say is, well, if you figured out that there's there's kind of a, a magic source of income here and we don't need those taxes, let's eliminate taxes and never have them again, because we don't need taxes. We can, we can print new money. But the study of MMT says actually taxes are very important, but maybe for an unobvious reason pertaining to inflation. So why do we still need taxes? Okay, well, remember, I just want to go take one tiny step back and just sort of reassert the point that it's not that we can print money, it's that there is no other way for the government to spend but to create new money as it spends. So it's it's newly created digital dollars and there's no other way for it to work. And so, you know, your question is is a very good one. So once you recognize that that the government spends its currency into existence, then you say well, then why do we have to pay any taxes at all? Why not just let the government, you know, spend and forget the tax piece, which, by the way, is exactly what Congress has been doing, right? Let's just take the CARES Act as one example. The biggest relief package that has so far gotten through both the House and the Senate and signed into law, that was $2.2 trillion. And that bill was Congress 
writing what we in the D.C. Beltway circles call a clean bill. In other words, it was not offset. The spending was not offset. The government just simply said, Congress said, listen up, Fed, we are ordering up $2.2 trillion. Get ready because you're going to carry out the payments that we have authorized on behalf of the U.S. Treasury. That's how it works. So this is an example of Congress committing to spending money it did not have, right? It's just what it has is the power of the purse. It can commit to spending $2.2 trillion, and the Fed, as the government's fiscal agent, will carry out those payments by changing the numbers in the appropriate bank account. So for people who got that $1,200 stimulus check, the way that that money got into your account is that the Federal Reserve and the bank that you bank at changed the numbers upward in your account. And so there was no pairing of you know, higher taxes to go along with this. So why do we sometimes increase taxes? Why do we have taxes at all? So in the book, you know, I, I go into a lot of detail on this. If you wanted to start up a currency from scratch, then a tax or something like it, fees, fines, other obligations, governments impose to get a population, to put a population of people in a position where they need to earn the state's currency in order to settle their tax or other obligation to the state. And, you know, we could talk a lot about this, but I, we don't have time. So I'll just say that one reason for taxes is that they allow governments to start up a currency from scratch. Once that currency has been started up and now people are accustomed to having this currency around, they begin making their own payments and transacting in that currency, right? And, and the government can use the tax lever to pull some of those dollars back out of our hands. So taxes are important because they're one way that the government can reduce the purchasing power of all the other spenders in the economy. So if the government wants to come in and do a big, ambitious infrastructure project, and spend trillions of dollars into the economy, it might be worried that spending trillions of dollars could push prices higher, could lead to inflationary pressure. And to offset or mitigate the inflationary pressure, it matches up some of its new spending with higher taxes. So it makes room for the government to be able to spend those dollars into the economy without creating inflationary pressures. Taxes are important because they allow government to pull a lever if it's interested in rebalancing the distribution of wealth and income. You say, I'm going to put this new tax on or push this existing tax higher because I think the distribution of wealth and income has become so extreme that we want to try to you know, rebalance things. So governments use taxes for things like that. And then finally, you, know, you can use taxes to incentivize or disincentivize behavior in the economy. So, uh, you know, a uh, gas tax, carbon tax, uh, earned income tax credit. I mean, you could, you know, work it both ways to try to get people to do or not do certain things. So lots of important reasons for taxes. But in MMT, the one way that we do not think of taxes is as a source of revenue to pay the government's bills. Now, I know that one of the ways that you do think about taxes in MMT is as a, a, a preventive measure to overcome the tendency of that spending to bring about inflation. What I haven't seen addressed, and maybe I just haven't read enough about it, is, wait a minute, inflation tends to be a, a vicious cycle with a long lead time that has to do with inflation leading to inflation expectations, leading to acceleration of velocity of money, and it feeds on itself. And once it gets going, it's hard to break it. So it seems to me like I, I worry about whether, you know, how do you know the tax is enough to prevent that cycle from starting? And how do you break out of that cycle if some of the money that's being created through MMT by the government financing more of its spending just by printing new money does start to lead to that widespread inflation. The other problem that I, I, I have understanding this inflation argument is at least some people, and maybe this is the politicians as opposed to the MMT scholars, are saying, well, it's really what we have to do to prevent the inflation. We've got to tax the rich, specifically tax the rich. Well, wait a minute. 
the rich are the people whose spending habits are not really directly impacted by their tax burden and their inflation because they've got enough assets that they can continue spending. So how do you overcome the potential of creating a vicious cycle of inflation? Is it just taxes or are there other measures that MMT uses to overcome that inflation risk? Okay. So let me start by saying there's a terrific, short, accessible piece, but your audience is very smart so they can handle the the higher order stuff. There's a piece in the Financial Times that was co-authored by three MMT scholars. And I think the title of the piece is something like how MMT thinks about inflation or how MMT manages inflation, something along those lines. Uh, You can, you know, people can find it because I wouldn't have time to do it all justice here. But Look, okay, let's start by recognizing that inflation, as you say, is a dynamic process. It's a continuous increase in the price level. It's not a one-off. It's complex phenomenon. There isn't an economist on earth who can write down for you a model of inflation that will apply in all times across you know, space and time. Nobody can do it. The Federal Reserve, Daniel Cerullo, who was a Fed Board of Governors member, you know, he rolled off the Board of Governors and went out and one of the early speeches he gave just made huge headlines because he went out and he said, you know what? The Fed does not have a working model of inflation. We don't know. So I know that economists, I'm one, wave their hands around and use the phrase inflation expectations. But I'll be honest with you, it's it's pretty much baloney. Okay, it's what we it's what we hide behind when we run out of realistic things to say. So once upon a time there was a quantity theory of money and man you could write that equation down everybody could see it and you said inflation happens because velocity is constant and the real economy tends to full employment and once you apply a little calculus to the quantity theory to the equation of exchange then you know that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon money supply growth rate accelerates inflation will accelerate you know to the same degree well that's clearly silly and wrong and you know we have decades of experience with QE where people who relied on that thinking expected quantitative easing to drive inflation or possibly hyperinflation of course it didn't do any of that then you had the phillips curve and you say well it's the phillips curve that's the model i'll write down and that's my inflation model well listen nobody believes this stuff anymore and you can expectations augment the phillips curve all you want and it still isn't workable so I don't believe that, you know, we should think of inflation as something that happens because expectations become unanchored and people formulate ideas about where prices are headed and then it becomes self-fulfilling. That's just silly stuff that we make up. I think we need to be more serious than that. Prices change because producers raise prices. People change prices. They don't just happen and they certainly don't just happen across all categories of consumer goods. So let's think a little bit harder. You know, if I go downstairs after this interview, and and I hope this doesn't happen, but if I go downstairs and find my basement is flooded, I don't just run to one part of the house and say, oh, I have to stop the flooding in the basement. I don't know what caused the flooding in the basement. I don't know if a kid left a faucet running, if a toilet overflowed, if a pipe burst, if, you know, the dishwasher's leaking. I got to find the source of the problem. And I think that's the way we in MMT think about inflationary pressures. You have to look under the hood. You have to go to what is driving that headline price inflation. I'll give you just one quick example. The Supreme Court's going to take up the case on the Affordable Care Act, right? That's going to happen soon. And there is a chance that the Supreme Court will say the ACA is unconstitutional. And provisions like protections against pre-existing conditions, that could go away. Some of the cost controls around medical reimbursements and prescription drug prices and so forth, that cost containment, that could go away. And, you know, people who, who look at the U.S. experience in recent years, post-ACA compared to the years immediately before the Affordable Care Act passed, people say, listen, the Affordable Care Act took us a long way toward, you know, constraining inflationary pressures in this period because there were all these controls. Now, 
let go of all that stuff. Imagine that healthcare, you know, health insurance companies are free to raise premiums and price discriminate based on pre-existing conditions and pharma companies can, you know, be more aggressive with prescription drug prices and so forth. You can easily imagine headline inflation ticking up for those reasons. Now, how would you fight that? I mean, would it make sense to say raise taxes in order to combat that kind of inflationary pressure? I think that's crazy. But would it make sense to say the Fed should raise interest rates to fight? Now, that's equally crazy. So when I talk about inflation and when when we in the MMT scholarly community talk about it, it's a much more nuanced conversation because you have to recognize that you know, there are things you can do on the regulatory side. There are a lot of non-fiscal, doesn't have to do with cutting government spending or raising taxes, um, ways to deal with inflationary pressure, but you got to know what's causing it. I want to move on to what you actually have identified as the next myth in the book, which would also be the feedback that you'd probably get from a lot of people who would say, look, what you're talking about doing here amounts to stealing from future generations. You're describing a way without having to raise taxes, which makes it more politically viable for the government to spend more money that we don't have and increase the national debt that's going to have to be paid off someday by our children and grandchildren. That's immoral. Why is that a myth? Well, it's a myth because none of it makes any sense whatsoever. I mean, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll just be as as kind of upfront and candid as I can. I think that's just really silly. And and I know that it's common and I, and I know that people repeat it. And I know that sometimes serious people repeat these kinds of things. So this falls right back into the household analogy, right back into that trap of thinking like government as a household. And when we use words, like borrowing, like paying it back, calling this thing the debt, we are falling back into that household trap. And the federal government's nothing like a household. It doesn't operate its budget like a household. So here's just one example. Okay. When the government runs a deficit, it matches up the deficit spending by selling treasuries, right? We know that. And that's something it chooses to do, not something it must do. A government, sovereign government doesn't need to borrow its own currency from anyone in order to spend. But the government currently matches up its deficit spending with bond sales. So what happens? So the government spends $100 into the economy, taxes, let's say $90 back out. We say the government has run a deficit. We look at it as a shortfall. It's not a shortfall. The government's the scorekeeper for the dollar, right? It's adding 100 and subtracting 90. Somebody gets 10 points. Those are, that's $10. Now the government comes along and says, well, because I ran a deficit, I'm going to sell these treasuries, which means the government is going to subtract back out the $10 and replace them with 10 treasuries. So what the way that I look at it isn't that the government is borrowing in any meaningful sense. If I go to a bank for a loan and I sit down with the loan officer, I don't plop the money down on the desk in front of the loan officer and then ask for the loan. Okay, I'm there because I don't have the money. That's why I'm there to borrow. The federal government's the issuer of the currency. It doesn't borrow because it doesn't have the money. What it's doing is first supplying its currency and then transforming those dollars into a different financial instrument, into U.S. treasuries. So it's allowing us to hold dollars that amplify themselves over time, right? Th those are amplifying dollars. Why? Because they pay interest. So I look at the treasuries as a form of payment, not a form of debt. There's nothing being borrowed, there's something being paid out. And when the treasury matures, when the bond matures, it simply converts back into its original form. It converts back to the currency form. So paying it back, quote unquote, involves nothing more than shifting funds, right? Shifting funds from one account at the Fed, a securities account, into what's effectively a checking account, a reserve account at the Fed. That's all the more complicated it is to quote unquote pay it back. But I think that, you know, we have a communications problem. We don't have a debt problem. We just have chosen very unhelpful words to narrate what's actually taking place.
Well, if we don't think of it in terms of actual debt, and as you say, we can just print the money in order to pay expenses, and it's, it's, it's only a convenience that we happen to articulate that through a debt transaction, at least in the current system. Well, hang on a second. Doesn't printing that money dilute the value of the money that everyone who owns money has, and, and therefore, isn't it really a form of tax on the wealth of everyone holding dollars? So, look... It isn't a simple thing. I know a lot of people think just in somehow in their heads, there's this supply and demand framework and that if you have more supply of anything, then that automatically pushes prices down. The value of the thing goes down. But no, I mean, you know, it depends what happens with those dollars. So first, every deficit is good for someone, right? In financial terms, the government's deficit is a deposit. It is a financial contribution to some other part of the economy. Now, every deficit is good for someone, but deficits do different things, right? For for whom? Who gets that contribution? And what is it being used to accomplish somewhere in the economy? So if the government's making investments in you know, infrastructure and education and R&D, those are the three categories where economists by and large agree that you get the greatest long-term benefit from that kind of spending. In other words, if you're worried about the value of the dollar going down over time because the government is spending, how about recognizing that certain kinds of government spending actually improve long-term productivity and boost potential real wealth, real output, real... So no, there's no simple, you know, if the government spends more than the value of the currency goes down. No, you can have a much stronger economy as a consequence and a, and a much stronger currency along with that. Professor Kelton, I haven't gotten even to all six myths in the book, but I want to jump ahead because I know you've got a very tight schedule today and just a couple more minutes for us. I think that your voice, uh, you're extremely articulate, you're very persuasive in your arguments. Uh, I won't be at all surprised if you replace Janet Yellen as the most influential woman in the history of finance. Let's pretend that that comes true. What do you want to be remembered for changing? How does the world, or particularly the U.S. government, need to change if you were in charge and applying MMT to make the world a better place? Well, oh, boy, Eric. I mean, <laughs> look, I get frustrated by the nature of the debates that that take place in this country and around the world. And, you know, I think for me, a lot of this is just I, I think gratuitous suffering is just the worst kind of suffering because, you know, we have the capacity to do better and to do better by our fellow Americans, to do better by others. And, you know, if we can improve economic life for millions of people without creating harm, why wouldn't we do that? And so I just I would like to see us begin to have a better debate, you know, without reference to the sort of things we've been talking about, some of these myths, right? That we can't do X, Y, and Z because there's no money to do it. We can't do these things because China won't lend us the dollars. We can't do these things because the future generations are already too burdened by debt. We can't do, I want to clear through all of that and get us to a place where we have a more constructive, fruitful national debate about what our priorities are, what is the proper role of government, what programs are we collectively willing to support and, you know, in terms of our nation's real resource capacity, what can we afford to do? And so if we could just get to the point where we start having the debate on the right kind of playing field with the with the right limits in mind, that's sort of what I'm after. I don't have greater ambitions in a sense than trying to open up, help to open up space to have that better debate. One of the myths that you, you have in the book is entitlement programs like Social Security and Medicare are financially unsustainable. We don't have time to get into that, but I just want to ask, what is the constraining factor? I mean, obviously, if we really can afford those things, we can print money. Why stop with Social Security and Medicare? Why not have a Mercedes and maybe a private jet for every single citizen? There's got to be some reason to stop. Is it just the risk of inflation or are there other constraints? Well, I mean, there are political constraints, but the the relevant constraint is inflation. It is our nation's real resource capacity. It's how many people do you have? 
that are of working age and capable of working and producing in the economy? How many factories, buildings, machines? What are your raw materials? What is your state of technology? You combine all of the real resources you have, and that tells you what you're capable of domestically, right? And then the U.S. has the good fortune of also being able to tap productive capacity in other parts of the world because the rest of the world is willing to to produce for us, right? They will accept the dollar and we can have access to some of their productive capacity too. So, you know, with respect to seniors, if we want to care for seniors in a way that makes us proud to call ourselves Americans, we say we have this uh, retirement security system in place called social security. People are always talking about how it's, you know, unsustainable. We're going to have to make tough choices and cut benefits or, you know, means test the program so that everybody doesn't get to benefit from social security. That's all wrong. I mean, Alan Greenspan told us how wrong that was years ago, testifying before Congress under oath when he got a question from then Congressman Paul Ryan, who said, look, social security is going broke. You know, we got to do something about this. Don't you agree, Mr. Chairman? And Greenspan leaned into the microphone and I thought he gave the most brilliant and honest answer. And he said to Paul Ryan, I don't agree. He said, there is nothing about the way the system is set up today that is financially unsustainable. His exact words were, there's nothing to prevent the federal government from creating as much money as it wants and paying it to someone. Okay. That is the first point he made. But the second point is the really important one. He said, the question is, how do you set up a system which assures that the real assets are created, which those benefits are employed to purchase? And what he meant is that we have changing demographics. And the demographic changes have been underway for a long time. On average, every day in America, 10,000 people hit the age of 65. Okay, they can move into retirement if they want to at that point. And and Greenspan said, you know, basically we're we're being left with a shrinking population of people to produce the stuff, right? To actually kick out the goods and services in the economy and a growing population of retirees. If we continue to mail checks or deposit, you know, digital dollars in their bank accounts, those seniors can turn around and spend that money into the economy, competing with all other spenders in the economy. So for Greenspan, like every central banker in the world, inflation is the thing you worry about. And Greenspan's looking at this and saying, how do we know that in the future, 10, 20, 30 years from now, when those checks go out, the economy, the U.S. is going to be a productive enough economy to produce all the goods and services that both seniors and the current working population want and need. If that's the case, if we are productive enough, there's no problem. Keep the system running. You can even make it more generous. The risk is if we are not a productive enough economy going forward, then all we end up with is more intense competition for a dwindling pool of real goods and services and hence an inflation problem. So you know, it seems to me the fight over Social Security should be about, you know, which political party has a better plan to increase the probability that in 10, 20, 30 years, we are a productive enough economy to kick those goods and services out, to allow seniors to have a sustained, you know, standard of living in retirement and to raise living standards for working people going forward. We just need a productive enough economy. We ought to argue over who has the best economic platform to get us there. Professor Kelton, I know that we've already gone past the hard stop in your schedule. I can't tell you how much we appreciate a terrific interview. Listeners, the book is The Deficit Myth by Professor Stephanie Kelton. It's also available in audiobook form, narrated personally by Professor Kelton. Stephanie, anything you want to add before I let you go? No, I mean, like everybody probably listening, uh, waiting on pins and needles to see whether Congress is going to come through with another relief package. You know, that's that's kind of the, the thing that weighs on my my mind right now. Well, I can't thank you enough for a terrific interview. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor. Farmland investing has been a popular macro trend among billionaires and big institutions for the last decade. 
But the high cost of buying an entire farm put this asset class out of reach to all but big institutions and the ultra-rich. FarmTogether.com allows any accredited investor to invest in fractional ownership of several different categories of farmland. I recently did a full-length interview with FarmTogether.com founder and CEO Artem Milinchuk. We discussed the macro argument for farmland investing, performance and correlation comparisons to conventional asset classes, and the different types of farmland and their investment characteristics. If you're an accredited investor, I recommend that you listen to that interview and learn why farmland investing might be a fit for your portfolio. You can find the download link in your Research Roundup email. Or just type the word farmland into the search box on our homepage at macrovoices.com. Check out farmtogether.com today. You'll be glad you did. Macro Voices is a listener driven program. Please email requests for specific future interview guests to requests at macrovoices.com. We also welcome your suggestions for how we can improve the program. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, a great interview with Stephanie Kelton. You know, when I was listening to it, all I was thinking about was, uh, you know, the fact that we are in the, in the late stages of this debt super cycle. And for many people, the uh, only solution to all of this debt is this idea that there's going to be some sort of explicit debt default. But uh, when you go through history, there are other ways of dealing with very large sums of debt this way. And one of them is to inflate it away through financial repression and through different ways of printing money and, and creating that inflation. And it's interesting that MMT seems to be coming around at a time when when we need to, to deal with all of the debt in this late stages of that super cycle. Nonetheless, I want to move on. When you predicted that she might upstage Janet Yellen as one of the most influential women in the history of finance, that was actually the last thing I expected to hear from you to say. Did you really mean that? Or, or has she converted you to become an MMT believer? Well, those are two separate questions. But yes, I absolutely believe that Stephanie Kelton is going to be one of the most influential people of our time and, and perhaps the most influential woman in the, in the history of finance. I think that's entirely realistic. Now, that doesn't mean that I agree personally with her views, but the biggest lesson, the most important lesson that I've ever learned in investing is not to confuse an objective analysis of what is happening to the market with what you wish was happening or what you think should happen or what you think ought to be good for the world. Uh, what's happening is Stephanie Kelton is making incredible inroads and is having an incredibly influential effect on public policy to promote the adoption of the principles of MMT and to encourage politicians to think more about using the power of central banks to print money rather than assuming that any financing for spending has to be sourced by increasing taxes. So that's what's happening, whether I agree with it or not. And uh, the only thing you can do as an investor is to embrace what's really happening in the market. So you never answered my question about whether she converted you to becoming an MMT believer directly. But since your answer was about accepting things you don't want or like, should I interpret that as a no? Well, I think we have to separate monetary theory from political ideology and talk about them separately, which frankly, almost nobody does. Now, I hold personally an ideological view that governments are always incompetent and inefficient and that society is better served when the size and budget of government is kept to a minimum and most functions of the economy are handled by the private sector. That's just my personal belief system. Professor Kelton and a whole lot of other people hold the opposite ideological view that larger governments can and should be used to correct social inequities that exist and which were created by the capitalist system. Now, I completely agree that those social inequities exist and need to be corrected. Uh, I don't happen to agree that bigger government and more spending is the way to solve them. But the point is, neither of those ideological views have anything to do with monetary theory and how money really works. But people with both sets of ideological views are prone to seeing the side of monetary theory that seems to confirm or validate their own 
ideological biases. People on my side of that divide have been guilty, and, and I admit to this myself, have been guilty of predicting that, you know, deficit spending is going to ruin us and that we're going to have an Armageddon. For 50 years, gold bugs have been predicting deficit spending is, is, is going to result in a collapse of the dollar and, uh, you know, the end of the world. Those things haven't happened yet, and none of us would have believed 10 years ago that central banks could literally create $10 trillion of U.S. dollar equivalent across all of the different central banks around the world in new money creation through essentially the printing press, through the, the mechanism of quantitative easing, and that it wouldn't blow up the system with some kind of inflation. So has Stephanie Kelton converted me to her ideological views about more spending and more social programs being the right way to solve society's problems? Heck no, definitely not. But has she woken me up to the fact that there are some aspects of what I thought I knew about the laws of monetary theory, which in reality were based on my own biases, my own ideology causing me to embrace and like ideas by people like von Mises, which, you know, just kind of resonated with the way I feel about things, which maybe are not completely accurate. Yes, she definitely has opened my eye to that. So I think the key to this, and it's not easy, is you have to be willing to really put your own ideology in a box and look objectively at how we previously understood, not whether spending is a good idea, but the monetary theory of when governments print money out of thin air in order to finance their spending rather than raising taxes in order to do it, does that have the dire consequences that the sound money crowd, myself included, have claimed that it has? Well, certainly the, the experience of the last 10 years has proven that if the things that we've feared are really the way it has to happen, well, it doesn't happen as quickly as we thought it was going to happen because most of us never thought you could have gone 10 years of doing what they've been doing without it blowing up in our face. So does that mean that it's about to blow up in our face and just hasn't happened yet? Or does it mean that we just plain got it wrong? My ideology hasn't changed. I still think smaller government is better, but I, I do recognize that I am overdue in opening my eyes to the fact that some of the assumptions that I had about certain things that if you do this, it's going to lead to a Weimar Germany style hyperinflation, you know, it, it just doesn't work that way. Or if it does work that way, it takes a heck of a lot longer than I thought for those things to play out. So the key, I think, is to separate that monetary theory and how it really works from your own ideological biases. And, and that is what I've gained from this whole experience of evaluating modern monetary theory. Okay, since you seem to be on a roll and willing to admit your ideological biases in this conversation, what have you learned about monetary theory that differs from your prior sound money crowd belief system? Well, I really wish that we had had time to get into this with Dr. Kelton, because I would love to have a, a long-form discussion with her about this. But I think the clear and undeniable lesson of the last decade's monetary experiment is that when central banks start conjuring money out of thin air to finance deficit spending, the adverse consequences that have been predicted by the sound money crowd simply did not happen in the time frame that the sound money crowd said they were inevitably going to happen in. So that leaves you with a little bit of a conundrum. You either have to conclude that means they had it wrong. It doesn't really work the way we thought it did. Or it really does work the way we thought it did. There really is no free lunch, but it takes longer for those adverse consequences to really occur than we thought possible. So the dollar hasn't crashed the way a lot of people thought it would. It hasn't lost its reserve status. There's no sign of hyperinflation. It's taken a full decade uh, of central banks trying to create inflation just to start to produce any CPI inflation. Now, they certainly produced plenty of asset price inflation with their quantitative easing. But in terms of CPI inflation, you know, we're just starting to get there. The fundamental premise of MMT is that the only real reason for governments not to just print whatever money they need to in order to finance public spending is the risk of inflation. And I couldn't agree more with that. So there's no doubt that we all agree 
that the reason to not do this is the inflation risk. Now, you heard Professor Kelton in this interview describe in her own words that the capacity of the economy in terms of how much room you've got, how much energy, if you will, does the economy have to print more money to do more good work with, because she thinks of all of the the spending programs of government as doing good work. How much of that good work can you do before inflation starts to bite you? So she's got definitely a model that's very consistent with my understanding of inflation being the risk. So on some levels, it's very true. The thing is, if we agree that inflation is the risk, and and certainly the credible MMT academics like uh, Professor Kelton and Warren Mosler acknowledge that risk, my take is that it really boils down to two manifestations of that inflation risk, which just to categorize them, I'll call it the vicious cycle risk, which is the risk of it really mushrooming out of control before you realize what's happened, and the moral hazard risk, which has to do with how politicians reinterpret the prescriptions of people like Stephanie Kelton and Warren Mosler. So frankly, I'm going to admit that I do have ideological biases that make me more skeptical about MMT's ability to deliver its promises without triggering those risks. I also think the other side is just as biased by their ideology. They want to come up with a reason why it's okay to just do all this spending and it's not going to have any adverse consequence. I think everybody has to check their ideology at the door and really look more carefully at what the real parameters of that inflation risk are and how early you're able to see it coming before it's too late. All right, Eric, let's uh, circle back here because let's better define those two manifestations of risk, inflation risk you mentioned. You called the first one the vicious cycle risk. What did you mean by that? Well, I loved Professor Kelton's answer to my inflation question where she basically said in so many words, all the experts are full of shit and they don't really know how inflation works. You hear all these different theories about velocity of money and inflation expectations be getting more inflation and more inflation expectations. There is a vicious cycle. I think that most academics would agree that once an inflation gets started, it becomes a self-reinforcing process and inflation expectations where people anticipate more inflation inflation and that changes their behavior is a part of this. So the corollary is, and she's right to say that, look, you know, you can't just go based on any of these academic models because frankly, they're unproven and nobody really knows for sure. But the corollary to that is, well, okay, if the academics are, are really kind of full of it and nobody really knows the exact parameters of when an inflation is starting to get out of control, then how do you know how long it's safe to keep doing this MMT stuff and printing money before you get to the point where an inflation has started that could start to mushroom out of control and essentially where you could have started a fire that you're not going to be able to put out. So I'm willing to acknowledge that the 10 trillion US dollar equivalent of quantitative easing didn't cause a runaway inflation the way a whole lot of people, myself included, predicted that it would at least not yet. Well, does that mean it's coming? And is it something where once it gets started, you won't be able to stop it? And all those $10 trillion of printing will have contributed to something like allowing a forest to dry out over a period of years to the point where it becomes a major you know, runaway fire risk? Or is it really not such a big deal? I don't know the answer to that. I think that a fact that the MMT crowd ought to acknowledge is they don't know either. They don't know whether their prescriptions telling people, look, we can, we can just have central banks print money. Is that potentially going to start a fire that can't be put out once it's burning? Are we going to get to the point where, yeah, it does eventually start in inflation and that inflation runs away and it's too late to do anything about it? Or is it as simple as monitoring a few indicators and at a certain point you realize, okay, this is where we're going to stop printing? I haven't seen anything to persuade me that the MMT crowd is really on top of that risk and knows how to stop an inflation before it starts to run out of control. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but nothing I've seen persuades me that they've really got that under control. And frankly, I think they're as guilty as I am of having allowed their ideological biases to affect their judgment as well. 
Okay, Eric, but you re- uh, also referenced the, the second major category of inflation risk was the moral hazard risk. Uh, what did you mean by that one? Patrick, I think that a perfect analogy here is Keynesian countercyclical stimulus theory. You know, Lord Keynes takes a lot of crap that he doesn't deserve. People think that he advocated, you know, spend and spend and spend. He didn't. What he said is in downtimes, government should come to the rescue by spending borrowed money. And then when the economy recovers, government should pay back all of that borrowed money in order to slow down the expansion and also reset the books. Well, what happens is the politicians just take the part of it they like. They like the spend part in downtimes, but when the economy gets good, the idea of slowing it down in order to pay back the borrowed money never seems to happen. So the risk that I see is... The seasoned academics like Stephanie Kelton and Warren Mosler, they definitely understand that this inflation risk is very real. And if that inflation starts to go out of control, you can have a self-reinforcing vicious cycle that could lead to an inflationary or even hyperinflationary greater depression. They understand that risk. But what they're doing is they're handing politicians a recipe book for how to spend and spend and spend without having to tax anyone in order to do that spending. Politicians are going to eat that stuff up. They're going to love it. And then when we get to the point where Stephanie Kelton and Warren Mosler are telling their their politicians, hey, wait a minute, guys, this is we've reached the point we told you about. Remember we said that inflation thing, that was the big gating. Well, our indicators are telling us it's time for you to stop. The politicians are suddenly going to stop paying attention to Stephanie Kelton and Warren Mosler, just like they stopped paying attention to the part of John Maynard Keynes' prescriptions, which says when the economy gets better, you're supposed to pay back the borrowed money, uh, not just forget that it ever happened. So what I'm concerned concerned with is not that Stephanie Kelton has the wrong idea, but that she's handing a prescription to liberal politicians, which is going to allow them to spend and spend and spend on printed money. And when the indications that Stephanie Kelton and Warren Mosler say are time to stop doing it because inflation is showing its ugly head, I don't think the politicians are going to stop. And I think that's the biggest risk. Okay, Eric, let's put this all together now. How would you summarize your overall view on MMT and where monetary policy is heading after reading Professor Kelton's book and after doing this interview? Well, first things first, get ready for MMT. It's coming and it's coming in a big way and there's no stopping it. I meant what I said about Stephanie Kelton being one of the most influential women in the history of finance. She's very smart. She's very well-spoken. She's very articulate. She's very persuasive in her arguments. And she has the attention of a lot of public policymakers right now. So whether you agree or not, it's coming. Focus your attention on investing around the expectation that it's happening, whether you like it or not. If you hold the old school view or you have the hesitations that I held about how MMT could go wrong, I think you owe it to yourself to step back and ask whether your own ideology was biasing your views. Because certainly, this whole money printing experiment, I mean, it went much farther than I thought was possible. And I recognize now that my ideological beliefs about how I think the world ought to work were causing me to think that certain things were impossible and would blow up the system, which politicians have done anyway, and the system hasn't blown up yet. I do think we're taking extreme risks. I have huge reservations about the large-scale adoption of MMT, eventually leading us to a situation where we get to an inflationary greater depression that could wipe out the entire developed world fiat money system. Seriously. But that's not today. It's not tomorrow. It's a long way in the future. What I would predict, though, is I'm not saying I think, oh, they're going to try MMT and it's going to flop. 
I, I would say the opposite. I think that MMT will be adopted by politicians. There will be more money printing. And I think it will be fabulously successful for the first several years. Because as soon as you're spending a whole bunch of money in order to make the world better, um, it works at first. It's not until the inflation, which is created as a result of that, with a long lag factor actually kicks in and you can't fight that inflation until you have a problem. So I think it's going to be perceived as fabulously successful for the first few years. That's going to beget much more political support. Uh, they're going to do it more and more. Eventually, we're going to get to the point where there's an inflation problem. And Stephanie Kelton and Warren Mosler will be the first ones to stand up and say, hey, we told you when you get to the inflation constraint, you, you got to stop printing money at that point. And I predict that the politicians will be addicted as crack addicts to printing money without having to tax anybody in order to spend on whatever their, their next scheme is to buy votes by uh, promising people some kind of benefit. So I think we're headed toward a whole lot of spending that eventually leads us to the kind of inflation that Stephanie Kelton herself says, that's time to stop printing money when you get to that inflation limit. And I think they're going to keep on printing money. And I think that moral hazard risk of the politicians misinterpreting the prescriptions of MMT is is the really big risk. But it's not going to happen right away. I think that it will be perceived as very successful at first. Yeah, well, it's too bad that Professor Kelton wasn't available for a longer interview. I would have absolutely loved to have heard her take on all of these points. Well, so would I. I really wish that we could have done a longer interview. We'd love to have her back. If she ever wants to come back and do a longer form interview, it would be great. Perhaps she has more time after the election. I do want to make sure, though, that we express our appreciation. She doesn't usually do podcast interviews at all. The fact she gave us a half an hour was really generous, and we really appreciate it. I'd love to go the next level of depth on these issues with Warren Mosler. As I mentioned at the end of the market wrap before we even got into this interview, we have been in contact with Mr. Mosler. Uh, he's been a perfect gentleman, but also very firm in saying no. Uh, I, I guess I'd say it was listener support on Twitter that uh, got Stephanie Kelton's attention and got her to uh, agree. Perhaps someone in the audience has Warren Mosler's ear and can talk him into it. We would welcome either of them to, to come back for a long-form discussion about these topics. I am convinced it's going to be one of, if not the most important topics in finance in coming years. And again, Again, folks, whether you like it or not, it's coming. This is going to be a really big trend. In any event, Patrick, what also is coming, and we're glad to have you back from a two-week break, is another Big Picture Trading Chart Deck. Listeners, you'll find the download link in your Research Roundup email. If you don't have a Research Roundup email, it means you're not registered yet. Just go to macrovoices.com, look for the red button that says Looking for the Downloads, right above Professor Stephanie Calton's picture. Patrick, diving into the chart deck, we've got the S&P 500 futures chart on page two. What's going on here? Well, here we are in the pre-elections. I mean, we're a stone throw away from uh, seeing uh, what is the outcome. And it's, uh, it's a little surprising how narrow of a range the S&P has been in. Uh, I mean, when you go back to look at what was going on in July and August, we were seeing this huge parabolic rise in the markets. Things were accelerating. Those FANG stocks were on fire. We were way overdue for a market correction. And, well, September did bring one about. But I, I was suspecting that it'd go a little longer, a little farther. But we really are at a stage this, at this moment where the very overbought condition that existed in the summer isn't there. It's far more of a, a range-bound price action. And so it is very likely in the post-election period that there is room for a, a bigger market reaction. So I thought on page three, what was just relevant to reference what happened last time. So this is going back to the S&P chart in 2016. And most people are obviously familiar with this, but it was a surprise when uh, Trump won. And the market initially Initially, took it uh, negatively, and in the uh, the after hours, the S and P plunged lower. But if you didn't have access to the the futures markets in the after hours, you literally didn't have a chance to react on it because by the time the markets were trading the next day. They were already heading 
to turning up on the day. And that was a surprise. The thing is that if Trump wins this time, I don't think it's going to catch market participants by surprise, even though, you know, everyone's arguing about what the odds are. I think everyone in, uh, that uh, is neutral recognizes that each there's an equal probability that uh, the, the election can swing either way. And so the question really becomes, is there a room for a risk off event on the stock market? And, you know, the one thing is, is that in my 20 years of trading experience and having gone through so many market crashes in the past, the one thing I've known is that rarely does the market crash on something that everyone is expecting, planning, and or analyzing. Almost always a market event happens when the market is blindsided by something that it wasn't expecting. And therefore, this election has been, over the last six months, one of the most anticipated things. The likelihood that uh, some big, huge, volatile event happens in the S&P, that window is closing on that pretty quickly here. Later in the chart book, we'll talk about how the volatility in the market Markets is setting up, but uh, certainly at this stage, the market is likely to to find this little uh, range pocket going into the elections, and then we'll see where it goes from there. Well, Patrick, one place where I strongly agree is I think the setup here is going to be for a move up in stock prices after it's crystal clear to everyone and all disagreement is over with respect to who's president to the United States. The thing is, that's not going to be known on election night this time around. And, and it, it's just, in my mind, it's all about the question of, okay, so that means there's a chance of a risk-off down in price event starting on election night or even before then until we figure out that it's clear. And, you know, do we have to have the Supreme Court tell us what the outcome is, you know, what's it going to take? We're in uncharted territory. So I don't know how big the down is, but I think the down eventually sets up a viable dip. And, and that's the opportunity to see a rally, because once we know and this certainty has been resolved, I think with either candidate, the market's ready to move up. Absolutely. I think there's a lot of traders that have been de-risking and deleveraging and raising some cash just to reduce the overall volatility into the elections. And once there's clarity, there is certainly the potential for money flow to come back into the market, at least initially. You know, there's a lot of different scenarios that can play out, especially if there's a, a blue wave sweep that could be interpreted bearishly down the road. But at least initially, uh, I think that all of this anxiety going into the elections has lots of room for, for money to be put back to work once there's clarity on that. Anyway, let's move on to uh, chart four. And what I continue to find fascinating is, is just how the dollar has remained non-committal. And even there were a number of these attempts for the US dollar to rally, which would be a euro breakdown on this chart. But each time US dollar weakness seems to prevail. And when we go to chart five, it, it seems to be so evident on the US dollar against that Japanese yen. And we find ourselves retesting at this moment, those August and September lows. And the, the big question here, was that breakdown we saw the other day, the beginning of potentially a retest of the March lows? And, and we see that uh, US dollar yen heading down to the 101 level. Nonetheless, uh, uh, dollar weakness continues to be dominant. And every time the bulls have tried to turn that trend, they've uh, been turned away. And that's, uh, that's some, we have to respect that uh, prevailing trend that continues to dominate here, right? Patrick, let's move on to Bitcoin on page six. I'm particularly curious about Bitcoin's outperformance relative to gold, because it's easy to look at this Bitcoin chart by itself and say, oh, it must be anticipation of uncertainty around the election. That's what's driving it higher. But, you know, if that was it, gold ought to be doing the same thing, and it's not. Exactly. And so big breakout on Bitcoin. Certainly, uh, there's no other way to put it. I mean, when it's breaking to a 52-week high, uh, um, especially on such kind of a tailwind, then it's certainly um, a trend that's established and we have to respect that. But what's interesting is that when uh, we look at gold, which is on page seven, you would think that gold would have a similar style uptick. And the reason we can draw that, uh, at least have inferred that that should have been happening 
So if you go to page eight, while the implied volatility in of Bitcoin, which is in orange, is obviously far greater and therefore uh, it shows that it's whipping greater here, but you can identify the correlation of gold and Bitcoin in terms of its movement against the dollar. And uh, they have, uh, there's many occasions where gold and Bitcoin have, have trended in the same direction. And we've truly seen a divergence here where gold has really stayed range bound and Bitcoin has taken off. I mean, we saw similar situations in the past back in the start of the year and a few other times where this happened. And often gold has caught up and so it's going to be really interesting to see whether gold is just a laggard here and that Bitcoin is advertising that uh, there's room for gold to go or whether they're finally going to decouple here and, and maybe uh, Bitcoin's going to uh, you know, march to the beat of its own drum. Moving on to page nine, crude oil, my own favorite chart. What do you make uh, of this? Because, boy, from a, a technical standpoint, it's, this consolidation has been going on an awful long time now. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the, it, at least uh, it's been uh, throughout September and most of October, there's just been such a tight range. And uh, I mean, I think you've already discussed it when we were talking in the market wrap. But, you know, the one question that I just wanted to ask here, I mean, we see this big pickup in yields because a lot of people are starting to anticipate or, or the idea that inflation is coming. But crude oil plays an important role in, in inflation expectations. And certainly we have not seen oil upticking that would create that, um, that kind of an assumption to be made. And I kind of just wanted to ask the question, I mean, could we really see inflation expectations continue to surge and all this to go and, and crude oil not break out? I mean, that's maybe it can. And it's certainly something that we're watching. I, I think that uh, determining which way it's going to break out of this trend is going to be so crucial. I mean, consolidations in oil could head down to the again to the mid to low 30s if there was a catalyst for it on the interim. But I generally think that these energy markets are so oversold that and so much of this bad news has already been baked into the cake that at some point uh, the sentiment is going to start to shift in the space. Well, Patrick, I agree. I think that we're definitely headed much higher on oil prices eventually. The thing is, I think the COVID crisis will take longer to play out than most people assume. So many people just have it in their head that a vaccine that's going to solve everything and the whole crisis comes to an end and everything goes back to normal just happens one day. There's no good reason to assume that. The uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus is probably going to become endemic and we're going to have to learn to live with it. But sooner or later, the, the damage that's been done and the inability, as Art Berman has described, of the U.S. shale patch to really recover to its previous production, uh, we've got to eventually get to much higher oil prices. The thing is, there's room to go lower first, and I think a return to 30 bucks before we eventually move back to the, the 50 to 80 range is entirely possible here. So we'll have to wait and see how it plays out. All right. Well, moving on to uh, page 10, I just uh, wanted to quickly talk about copper. Now, when when you're looking actually right across the commodity complex, particularly the grains have been on fire for the last couple of weeks on the upside. Uh, but even here, we have copper breaking to a 52-week new high. And so we, uh, while oil sta is staying in that pocket and staying very range-bound, we certainly do have a much broader commodity rally outside of golden oil. And it's going to be really interesting to see whether these commodities continue to run. And certainly when we had that breakdown candle on copper that we talked about here on the show back at the start of October, and we really were asking, was that a big breakdown move that was starting a correction? Well, almost immediately the bulls bought the dip and wiped out the breakdown candle within uh, within uh, three, four sessions. And that uh, that just continues to demonstrate that this is very well accumulated. And, um, and the bull trend is pretty intact here on copper. And, and it will be interesting to see how high they're going to make this push. Maybe we can see something north of three and a quarter towards 350 if, uh, if this really gains some traction. Let's move on to page 11 in the 530s yield curve. Boy, looks like a new high. 
Well, exactly. And this is interesting. And this is, comes back to that whole inflation expectations thing that we sort of were talking about just earlier. I mean, really, we continue to see this bear steepening well underway. I mean, it's the long end of the, uh, the curve that continues to see yields picking up. And, and when you're going into that shorter end, it's still very much pinned by the Fed on the downside. And to me, a real steepening would only should only really be happening when uh, true inflation expectations are, are here and we clearly are seeing a breakout and uh, so i asked the question is that really showing that the the market is now fully starting to price in this scenario that inflation is coming i don't know i i something in me i don't know if i trust it it's uh, it will be interesting to see in the next week or two whether or not this breakout fades or whether it sticks it's certainly going to be on my watch list uh, of things to watch. But what I, what I wanted to do though is move on to page 12 to just look at those junk bond credit spreads. What I find fascinating here is that even though we have huge unemployment potential on Main Street uh, USA, potential bankruptcies and small businesses and all sorts of other issues in there, I find it fascinating that there is no spike in credit risks showing on these spreads. Now, obviously, some people are saying that uh, Fed manipulation is is in full play here. But uh, really, I'd buy that if we were talking investment grade bonds. But uh, you know, I would you would think that you would start to see some risk starting to be baked into the cake here. And really, this uh, continues to be pinned very, very low at the certainly at uh, six month lows on the bottom of that range. It'd be really interesting to see if in the post-election period, whether we start to see some, some fear starting to be priced into these spreads. Patrick, let's move on to the VIX on page 13. I notice it seems like there's a real pattern here where the VIX just doesn't want to move below 20 back down into the teens. What's going on there? You know, uh, there's uh, no shortage of traders out there that are uh, drawing the little trend line breaks on the volatility index, uh, trying to anticipate whether or not a new breakout in volatility is imminent. But uh, I think that in the post-coronavirus uh, market crash period, volatility has been at an elevated level, largely because I think everyone was anticipating this volatility in, into the elections. And I think that there's a lot of risk at this stage to volatility uh, in the post-election period. And I think what's a good idea to kind of anchor off of is if you look on page 14, when we look at what volatility did or volatility index did in 2016, we can see that right in the post-election period, we saw in that case almost uh, a 50% wipeout of volatility premiums in a day. It was just extraordinary how volatility normalized in, in that post-election period. Now, I don't think we're going to see something as dramatic as that in this cycle. But when we do look at page 15 and see the way that the VIX term structure is set up, we have clear backwardation in that term structure, which is not normal. And when we're looking on the chart on the right-hand side there, we can see that natural contango in the VIX market is the natural place where, where it is. And, and one would think that this backwardation is really only there because of the election risk. And so one of the interesting things that I'm going to be watching here going into the uh, next two weeks as we go past the elections is that will we see the collapse of this term structure pushing it back into either a flattening or an outright contango on the other side. I actually think that that's a very reasonable proposition that it actually plays out that way. And more importantly, this is going to have a, a pretty big impact on a lot of different option strategies, particularly when people are positioning themselves into the elections with options. Uh, what would happen if volatility was to substantially um, decline in that time frame? And so that is certainly something I think uh, we're going to have to be watching. And I think uh, traders as uh, uh, being positioned with options into the elections need to start to explore different ways to hedge out the risk that volatility can move against them and uh, that vega risk that would exist uh, in, in being long too much gamma. And so certainly something that we're going to be discussing uh, in the weeks to come at Big Picture Trading. 
What do you think about the time spread uh, trade, maybe short February VIX futures, long May, anticipating that by February you'll, you'll get back to a normal contango structure in that curve? I think it's a very reasonable proposition that, that that happens. I don't see what the catalyst would be for the backwardation to exist, right? And so this readjusting, I think, is a very reasonable proposition and uh, is certainly something that uh, I think is a better odds than not. Yeah, I'm just looking at this chart. My, my immediate reaction to it is I'm tempted by short February, long May. And the reason I say that is if we get all the way to February and we still don't know who the president of the United States is, uh, it's, it's not going to get any better by May. Um, so, you know, I, I think either uh, we see a, a normal reversion of this curve or you're going to get to the point where the longer dated vol is going to start to go through the roof, too, as People anticipate uh, whatever is still going on in February. If, if the Civil War has begun, it's only going to get worse by May. More likely, none of that happens and everything reverts to a normal structure. So I like short Feb, long May. I'm going to think about putting that one on myself. So Eric, I wanted to leave it with uh, looking at page 16, looking at the S&P 500 volatility surface. Here I have it on the spies going out uh, four months. And we see the, the typical fat left tail skew here. And what's interesting, if you look at that little green line down the middle, it's showing you where the at the money strikes are. We can clearly see the volatility premium picks up going out over the election. And the pre-election options are priced at a much lower vol premium. So there's clearly that volatility kink that's in there that is uh, pricing that reaction in there. But I think that uh, there are different ways to take advantage of this. And so uh, what, that's one of the things I'm going to be doing is looking at what is the way that we can take advantage of that extra vol premium that's being priced in for election risk. Speaking of election risk, Patrick, I want to move on to page 17 because you are holding a webinar specifically about how to hedge your portfolio during the U.S. elections, no matter who wins, which is obviously a very timely topic. Now, that's for your big picture trading clients. Can people who sign up for the free trial get in on that webinar as well? Absolutely. So anyone who wants to join me on that webinar can uh, just sign up for a 14-day trial and uh, join me Thursday morning at 9.45 a.m. And we'll be covering all sorts of the different things to take into consideration. Obviously, the one thing that one has to reflect is, is that just buying a protective put or some other hedge for election risk really at this stage has more or less been fully priced in and you're going to pay a pretty rich volatility premium. And so there, it's about how do you construct trades that can reduce the overall volatility of your portfolio and take advantage of the volatility pricing versus you just outright paying for all of that rich vol premium. And the rest of the information about that free trial of Big Picture Trading is on page 18. We're going to leave it there for this week's show, folks. This episode of Macro Voices was made possible by FarmTogether.com, making farmland investing a trillion-dollar asset class available to all accredited investors. And by TopTradersUnplugged.com. Remember to get the ultimate guide to the best investing books ever written at toptradersunplug.com forward slash macro guide. For information on sponsoring Macro Voices, please visit macrovoices.com forward slash sponsor info. Listeners, be sure to register a free account at macrovoices.com. The benefit to you is you'll receive our research roundup email, which provides you with all of the best free content that we could find on the internet each week, including downloads associated with our guest appearances, as well as, of course, our post-game chart books. Patrick, tell them what they can expect to find in this week's research roundup. Well, this week, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview, as well as a link to the chart book we just discussed here in the post game. There's also a link to the Variant Perception blog on Don't Fear the Rise in Yields and a link to a Jesse Felder article of Who Said Value Was Dead. So you'll find this and so much more in this week's research roundup. That does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners, and we're always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners, that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup 
at macrovoices.com or tag it with the MVRR hashtag on Twitter, and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account, at Macro Voices, for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter, at Eric S. Townsend, and myself, at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening, and we'll see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com. <laughs>